Okay, so mining social network graphs. Uh, it's actually a pretty interesting topic and we are all used to social networks. So we'll be able to relate to things to some extent initially uh, before it gets just graph theory or graph algorithms um, and mathematics. So social networks, you, you know a lot of social networks around. Um, these are the more popular ones. Uh, so what is a social network? If we want to define it uh, in terms of our computer science language, uh, it's a collection of entities which we will uh, denote as the nodes of the graph, right? And uh, so this collection of entities can be typically people. That's why the social word comes in, uh, society, people, but can also be other entities. And then there would be at least one relationship between the entities of the network. Okay, so what do we mean by that? Uh, and, and that relationship will be typically represented by edges between the nodes. Okay, so it's a graph. Okay, so it, it, will, be, it will be graph and uh, entities are nodes and relationship will be represented by edges. Now there can be many types of this. So we'll just uh, see them. So for example, in let's say Facebook, kind of a network, friends. Uh, this particular relationship can be thought of as Boolean. Two people are either friends or they're not friends. So you can just think of that, uh, the, the, that age as an undirected age and unweighted, right? So at this relationship is also a Boolean and symmetric. If I'm friends with you uh, on Facebook, then you're also friends with me on Facebook. There is no way to do only one of them uh, in this particular setting. Uh, but uh, relationships can also have a degree. Uh, for example, you can set uh, as friends, family, acquaintances, or none within friends. So that's one feature Okay, by in Facebook or in uh, many other ways you can actually uh, set relationship degree. And these are like discrete degrees you categorize uh, not always these degrees are, uh, I mean, the discrete degrees may or may not be ordered. This example particularly gives you a sense that it like, it's like an ordering, family first and then friends and then acquaintances and so on, but doesn't have to be exactly ordered all the time. You can actually, it's more like a label to the uh, relationship, but it also can be a more continuous um, kind of a number. Uh, okay, nothing is a, strict mathematical real number in these things, but like a, any kind of a number uh, that the fraction of, let's say for the fraction of the average day two people spend talking to each other, right? So of course not, not in Facebook maybe, or maybe in Facebook also if people are talking in messenger and things like that. So, but in other kinds of networks, this can be a degree, right? The fraction of the average day two people spend talking to each other. So let's actually explore many, many other different kinds of networks, which uh, uh, we'll, we'll actually explore many other kinds of different uh, networks, which are like social. But uh, before that, given that we all know what these networks are like, uh, let's first identify one very important property of a social network, okay? So that property is locality or non-randomness property. So when are things random uh, and when are the things not random? So what happens in social networks are that the uh, relationships tend to cluster. Okay, so when people are related and some other people are related and so on, so they are kind of all become related to each other in a cluster. How? Let's say if A is related to both B and C, then the probability that B and C are related is higher than random. What do you mean by that? In other words, this means that having mutual friends increase the chance of two people knowing each other. Okay, explicitly, it would become like this, that let B and C be two random entities. Okay, so in, in, let's say in Facebook, okay, you pick up two random users from the whole of Facebook. What is the probability? Okay, this is the case one, what is the probability? that B and C are connected, that would be very small, right? If you just simply pick up from all 2 billion or whatever billion uh, users in Facebook and uh, to, to pick up to random um, users, 
it, the chance that they are connected or they are friends is very small. However, now if you add an extra condition that there is a mutual connection A, that means there is a mutual connection A between, uh, that means A and B are friends and as well as A and C are friends, then the probability of B and C being friends will be significantly higher, right? So in this case too, if A is a mutual connection, then uh, B and C, um, the, the probability that they are also friends is much higher than case one. So this is the locality property or non-randomness property of social network. That means a social network of, let's say, 2 billion nodes and whatever number of edges, okay? I, I don't really know the, that number for, let's say, a Facebook kind of a network, uh, is not like a random graph of so many nodes and so many edges. I mean, you can also construct a random graph, right? Uh, of so many, given given the number of nodes and edges, you can actually construct a random graph, but the social network graph will not be like that. It is not a random graph. Okay, so let's actually take a small example from the book and let's examine how we figure out uh, in this small example, whether this graph has a locality property, uh, right? This graph has the locality property. So, so this is a graph with Boolean relationships, undirected, unweighted, right? And how do we check for the non-randomness criteria? Now, what should we do for that? We have to compare with a graph of this size, which is random. So what is this size? That means there are seven nodes and nine edges, okay? The number of edges matter, right? I mean, if there are seven nodes, you can actually have a complete graph Right, and uh, then you will have like seven choose two uh, for 21 edges, right? So seven nodes and 21 edges, well, every, every node will be connected to every node. So if it's a very dense kind of a graph, then the probability of two random nodes being connected is anyway very high, right? So that's not the point. The point is you have to compare this, this particular graph with a random graph of this size now, obviously these numbers are so small that uh, the randomness doesn't really uh, show up, but uh, let's see, uh, let's see how it works. So in a random graph of seven nodes and nine edges, if X, Y is an edge, Y, Z is an edge, what is the probability that X, Z is also an edge? Okay, so that's, let's ask ourselves a question and let's calculate that. So for a ra large random graph, it would be close to the total number of edges total number of actually existing edges by the total number of edges that could have been, okay? The size of B choose two is in this case 21. I mean, there could have been at most 21 edges out of which there are nine edges actually. So if we simply, pee, and if the graph was random, then every edge being actually there between two randomly chosen nodes will be, the probability will be nine by 21, that is around 0.43. Now that is for a large graph. However, our condition is not just two random nodes. We are told that, well, X, we have, to, we have to find out the probability that XZ is an edge given that XY and YZ are also edges, right? So there is some Y which is actually connecting both of them. So that is known information. So so it's not that everything else is, uh, I mean, everything else is random, but those two are not random anymore. Yeah, somebody has a question. Sir, so if XY is an edge and YZ is an edge, then the probability of XZ being an edge, shouldn't that be uh, ideally half? Because not half, not half. Uh, we'll just go to that in the next, next bullet. Okay. okay. So the thing is, we know that XZ is an edge, YZ is an edge, right? Now, then that means we already know two of them are edges. Then our graph has, I mean, the graph has nine edges out of which two are known. So the rest, among the rest, there are seven edges, right? So then uh, what it will be is X, Y, and Y, Z are already edges. So we have to compute within the rest and that will be, well, two edges are known. So there are seven edges left and out of the total possibilities two, or two edges are gone. So 21 minus two, 19 edges are left. So out of 19, I will have seven edges. 
Now, what is the probability that X Z is also an edge, right? So if the graph is random, then that probability will be seven by 19. So that's like 0.37. Okay, so why did you say it would be half? Let's uh, come back to that. And no, I didn't consider the random aspect of the graph. Okay, okay, yeah, right. So it's a randomness thing. So this, this would happen if the graph is random. Now we will see whether our graph behaves more like a random graph or behaves more like a social graph, right? So how do we do that? Obviously, again, I keep repeating that this is a very small example. So, you know, things would make more sense statistically when uh, you have much larger um, graphs, but uh, I mean, this is also easier to visualize intuitively. Uh, so that's why we will do this. So now let's compute what is the probability for this graph in particular. And for that, what do we mean? For any x, y, and y, z, which are edges, we have to compute the probability that x, z is an edge. So for all possible combinations of x, y, z, given x, y, and y, z are edges, we have to compute the probability that x, z is an edge. So how do we do that? Oh, oh, sorry. Okay, yeah. So how do we do that? Uh, this we already did, right? So I just rewind it, yeah. So for each x, we'll check possible y, z and check if y z uh, is an edge or not, okay? So, um, so for if x equal to a, okay? And so if x equal to a and y z are b c, right? So x y and, uh, sorry, yeah, b c, uh, b c is all, uh, right. So if x equal to a, we know that a c and b c are already edges. We need to check whether sorry, AC and AB are edges, we need to check whether BC is also an edge, right? So we'll do this for every node. We'll take A, what are the other nodes for which A can be a mutual connection? B and C, right? Because AC and AB are already connected, then we validate whether BC is also connected, okay? So let's do that. So X, Y, Z, and yes or no, okay? So for A, X equal to A, the possibility of Y, Z is BC, yes or no, yes. And there, are, there is only one such possibility. I mean, for A, we only have two other nodes which can have this AC, BC, AC, AB kind of a connection. For X equal to B, however, we have more possibilities. We can check whether AC is an edge. We can check whether CD is an edge because B is connected to both D and C, okay? Um, and we can also check whether AD is an edge because B is also connected to A and D, right? So we have to check for all these three cases, how many are actually edges? Well, we see that only one of them are actually edges, right? Okay, okay. And then, uh, so similarly for C, we have only AB, that is one by one. For D, we have a lot of possibilities. I'm just quickly, quickly go through this. We'll figure out that there are two cases which are actually edges. For E, there is only one possibility, D and F. Well, they are actually edges, so one, one. For F, there are three possibilities, these three pairwise, uh, it's two by three. And for G, there is only one possibility, that's also one by one. So total, if we add the numerators plus, I mean, sum the numerators and sum the denominators, right? We'll get nine by 16, that is about 0.56. If the graph was random graph, the probability should have been around 0.37 or 0.43 or whatever, so around 0.4ish. Uh, and since this graph has probability 0.56 over all possible cases, this is not a random graph. Okay, so that's basically, uh, I mean, if you have to explicitly check whether a graph has the locality property, you have to do this. Now, obviously, for a large graph, you don't want to check for all edges or all nodes, right? But you can take a sample. You can take a random sample and you can uh, do this exercise like node-wise, Right, so node-wise exercise, and you can still get an idea of whether this graph looks like a social network graph or not. By the way, uh, we'll come to maturity of social networks later on, but remember that social networks initially, suppose, I mean, you know, Mark Zuckerberg starts Facebook, and well, it's still a graph, but there are very few users and they are still not connected to each other and all that thing. So it's a cold start uh, scenario. Well, so then the network is not mature. So then these properties may not show up. 
when a network is somewhat matured, obviously new users will come in and old users will get deleted and all, but that's a you know, small portion. But when the network is somewhat mature, then this property should show up. All right, any question as of now? Okay, so you, I hope you got the main point that if two random users are selected, the probability that they are connected is usually very small because if the, these kind of graphs are very sparse, out of 1 billion or 2 billion people, people usually are connected to around 500 or 1000 of them, right? So that's very sparse. However, uh, if we know given that there is a mutual connection, then the probability is much higher than otherwise or much higher than random. Okay, so this was the locality property and then we can conclude that this kind of a graph, this particular graph has the locality property. So now let's sit back a bit again from the technicalities and uh, just uh, get an overview of different kinds of social or in a way professional networks presently. I added the word in 2020 because this slide should have had different content 10 years ago and it will have a different content five years ago, five years later or 10 years later. So well, it's actually very evolving. Uh, the world is evolving. So yeah, right now, what do we see? That is the point here. So of course the popular ones, we all know about them, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, et cetera. LinkedIn is the professional uh, social network, uh, professional network rather. Uh, but also there are uh, several other types. So we can actually create, or we can think of networks coming out of many other uh, products or services that we use every day. For example, telephone networks. So let's say phone numbers are nodes. Okay, so phone numbers are nodes. Just think about, do not think about uh, the modern uh, messenger and app kind of things. Just think about your old telephone numbers, okay? Uh, maybe 15, 15 years ago when you were kids, right? So telephone numbers, notes are phone numbers. AB is an age if A and B talked over the phone within the last one week or month or ever. So this is actually a parameter, right? So this is a hyperparameter you can set. When do I decide that these two nodes will have an edge? And when do we say no, right? So if you only want to look at a current network, the last one week or a month, you can put a threshold on how much two people have to talk to qualify to be an age or things like that, right? So that's that can be an age. Now, this these kind of ages can be weighted by the number of times phone calls were made or the total time of conversation. You can also make them directed, right? It's possible that I call you all the time and you never call me back, right? So we talk only when I call you. Right? So then it's more like a directed age, right? So that's also possible. So similarly, any messenger network, like a WhatsApp or any other uh, chat software and things like that, uh, you can create such networks out of this. And obviously you can understand that the companies are doing that. Uh, then email networks, so nodes are email addresses, okay? Uh, a, B is an age, if A and B sent mails to each other within the last one week, again, you can make it a directed age, right? If you make it, yes? Somebody had a question? Okay, maybe it's just a, by mistake unmuted. So uh, if you make the option uh, one directional edges also, then it will allow the spammers to have edges because they are the people who keep sending you emails or all of us emails, but hopefully we do not reply, right? I mean, unless we, we, we fall into the trap of, uh, you know, we have won the lottery and so on. Uh, by the way, there are people who do that, but uh, so unless that happens, then uh, it's in one directional age all the time. Uh, so, so that way spammers will also have ages. So you have to decide what do you want to capture in your graph? And uh, based on that, you should define your criteria of what are the nodes and what are the edges and what should be the type of edge directed or undirected, or should it be weighted or unweighted? So this again could be weighted uh, and there are other networks possible like authors of papers, uh, two authors are connected if they wrote a paper jointly, et cetera, et cetera, right? So there are all these things possible. So these are other different kinds of networks and um, even otherwise, all these things I talked about are related to people, but it is totally possible that 
uh, you can have some other kind of complex networks which are not about people okay so but if they exhibit some kind of locality property then the methods uh, engineered or um, um, device for uh, these kind of networks can also be applied in fact some of the methods that we'll see were not in general uh, invented for our kind of social networks that you are used to they are in general invented for complex networks of lo with locality properties and things like that okay so uh, then there can be other uh, variations networks may not have only one kind of nodes so for example author paper graphs both authors and papers can be nodes and paper is also a node and author is also a node two authors are connected if they have written a paper together maybe and you can put weights to such ages based on the count or relative count how many times you know two people have written papers together two papers are connected if there are common authors if there are more than one common authors then the age is uh, age has higher weight you can also put ages between different kinds of nodes so basically you can have author to paper age paper to paper age and author to author age also now obviously you can say that at this point of time i want to only consider the author author graph then you can take the subgraph of author author out of this so you can only consider one aspect of such graphs if your if your application demands that or you can actually do both uh, it may not be immediately obvious when it helps to use both so this is one example uh, search query web page graph okay later on if you uh, study sometime uh, not in this course uh, query suggestion how let's say search engine suggest queries uh, when you keep typing right when you keep typing or when you have entered they may say okay did you mean this query or when you keep typing they show you lots of options right so obviously there are many many aspects in there but one of the aspects uh, is, is uh, can be from search query to web page graph that is if a user if you pay one user or more, many users clicked a page p after searching with query q then put an edge from q to p okay that means after searching with query q one clicks p now you can put an edge and you can also put a weight to the edge depending on how many uh, what is the probability of clicking the page p if it appears in the search result uh, after uh, you know hitting the search query q and then this kind of graphs can infer i mean using this you can infer query query relationships and that actually can be used for query suggestion okay so if set of pages clicked after query q and q1 and q2 have a significant overlap then these two queries are pretty much similar so instead of query q1 you could actually type q2 you know uh, there are details of these algorithms but uh, th these kind of uh, applications are also there so these are graphs which again will have a uh, locality property and uh, they are not really like uh, entities are not human or even phone numbers are human right so entities are not human or identifying human uh but uh, they are also um social network kind of graphs with in fact heterogeneous node types and age types um similarly you may have networks with several age types also so consider a popular social network like quiz facebook if a and b are friends then ab is an undirected or bidirectional age you can think of that so that's the usual thing but then it's not always just friends and friends a may follow b then a to b is a directed edge edges can be defined on many other criteria also for example does a like or comment in b's posts how often what percentage of the time so this is a unidirectional uni directional uh, age with weight maybe or maybe do a and b appear together in any photo that's a bidirectional thing right so are they tagged together in any photo so this is a facebook case Uh, i'm assuming the facebook setting so you can figure out many other um, such uh, cases in um, in in case of other social networks that are popular all right okay so question as of now fine so so far we have only heard stories all of which all of uh, all of these are actually very well known to you except that we have learned that social network graphs have locality property 
but now you will get into uh, actually one algorithm so in this chapter um, next this this class and the next few classes we will actually see different different algorithms uh, for performing certain tasks on social network graphs Let's sir talk. hello yes 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 uh, sir how to check whether a graph has a locality property so we actually did that uh, initially in the um, you know maybe 15 min 10 minutes ago uh, just maybe uh, just uh, um, uh, maybe go back and uh, listen to the video later okay okay so we actually did work through an example okay so uh, um, so clustering of social network graphs so we have seen normal clustering uh, very recently uh, then the point is if a graph has the locality property uh, then there will be clusters right so that is the whole idea now but then these are not like euclidean spaces right so um, what are the problems so clusters are communities here right so clusters are more like communities or people let's say people of the same institute or same company or people in a photography club or people with something in common between them so that you know they may not actually know each other but uh, depending on the way you constructed the graph maybe you constructed the graph based on whether they have common interest whether they have like the same movies and things like that right so so something in common between them that's your idea now we need to define a distance between points so this is a non euclidean space we need to define a distance between points so in graphs with weighted edges you can actually de define different kind of distances for example um, but in in graphs with friends or not friends like a boolean a kind of a relationship what do you do so one possibility is distance is either 0 or 1 so two nodes are either connected or not connected if they are connected the distance can be 0 or the distance is 1 um, or you can say 1 or an infinity or something like that right now if you don't do 1 and infinity you will actually fall short of the triangle inequality property which will not matter too much now um, the problem is um, they will uh, violate the triangle inequality however uh, we can fix them uh, by you know hacking it a bit let's say distance is 1 if they are friends and 2 if they are not friends or we can actually take the length of the shortest path we will actually see it later uh, you know how many hops do you need to go to get the other person right so those those kind of things are also there uh you can actually try different hacks and things like that so suppose this way you actually uh define a distance and also edges will have weights so if you have weights between edges then if it if two uh, the weight you can normalize to 0 1 and then 1 minus the weight can be your distance right so something like that you can define but whatever you do you will have a problem the problem with traditional hierarchical or point based clustering k means kind of clustering in both cases what you will have is the following so what happens for this particular graph in for this particular graph we have intuitively two communities right it's pretty clear that we have two communities and oh well there can be a connection between them but they are really two clusters now traditional clustering depends on the distance now <clears throat> what will happen is that if the distance between b and d are small then eventually it is quite likely that you will put them into the same cluster you will actually collapse so what may happen is severe merging of communities will be very likely of course you can take care of this by kind of going into the centroid mode so and considering distance between centroid or the maximum distance and things like that and so on but it will become too much dependent on what kind of graph do you have and what will be your maximum distance and so on so it will be very <coughs> i mean it will not be consistent with your intuition that way so uh, applying traditional either hierarchical or uh, point based clustering techniques directly on social network graphs will not be a good idea what we will do is yeah we will actually apply ultimately some clustering techniques in fact today we will see uh, the application of hierarchical clustering techniques uh, but 
we need to define a different measure uh, to replace the traditional way we understand distance. So that is called the betweenness of an edge. This is by Girvan and Neumann, uh, 2002. So betweenness of an edge AB <coughs> is defined by the number of pairs of nodes XY such that AB lies on the shortest path between X and Y. Let's think about that very carefully. Let's talk about A and C, or let's say, talk, let's talk about A and B here. How many, so what does this mean? That number of pairs X and Y such that AB will fall on the shortest path between X and Y. That means if you want to go from X and Y in the shortest way, well, there can be multiple shortest paths also, but let's say to, to, for our initial understanding, let's say there is only one shortest path. So if you want to go from X to Y in the shortest way, AB will fall, you have to cross the edge AB. Okay, so let's say what happens here. If you have to go from C to B, do you have to cross the edge AB? No. You have to, if you have to go from A to C, do you have to cross the edge AB? No. If you have to go from D to E, do you have to cross the edge AB? No, right? However, if you have to go from A to F or something, you have to cross the edge AB in the shortest way. So what are the many, many different shortest paths which are dependent on AB? That is the betweenness of the edge AB, okay? So intuitively, that is the idea. We'll actually see it in a lot of detail uh, in the next few minutes. So there can be more than one shortest path between X and Y, obviously. So <clears throat> for example, if you have to go from A to F, you can, uh, no, in this case, no, but let me check here. Okay, that's bad because I should be able to find some cases where there are more than one shortest path. Yeah, okay, so if you have to go from so E to G, D to F. E to F, there is a direct path. E to G, right? So if you go from E to G, then you can either go EFG or you can go EDG, right? <clears throat> so there are two shortest paths. So, uh, so there can be more than one shortest path and then the shortest, I mean, then the, you actually share, okay? So you actually share the load of the shortest path. So it's more like a flow, right? So <clears throat> it's like people are going from every node to every node in the shortest path how much load should fall on this particular edge? Is it a like a, is it like our Howrah bridge, right? So if people go from Kolkata to Howrah, uh, they have to cross one of the three bridges, right? So it's like that, I mean, but if you go from Kolkata to some other place of Kolkata, you have lots of options, right? So, so that's the kind of the idea. Uh, then the bridges actually separate the communities. That is the idea, okay? So we'll see that uh, in more detail soon. So what does a high score of betweenness mean? High score of betweenness then means the edge runs between two communities, more like a bridge. And <clears throat> betweenness gives a better measure than our older like normal distance or weights of edges and things like that. Uh, so in this example, edges such as BD will get a very high score than edges such as let's say AB or EA for things like that. So a BD definitely from anywhere in this island to anywhere in this island, okay, or in this cluster to this cluster, you have to cross BD, right? So that is the idea. So let's see one algorithm. Uh, okay, this is actually not a distance measure, but uh, it will actually not matter. So what will happen is we'll, we'll, we'll see an algorithm to compute betweenness of edges of the graph, and then we will drop edges with high betweenness to separate out communities. Okay, so that's how we'll do clustering. Okay, so let's uh, go about it. So the Girvan Neumann algorithm, the first step is you choose any node X and perform a BFS with X as a root. So let's say we choose E, same graph, okay? But since we are choosing a root, I'm drawing it as a tree. Okay, so since we, uh, uh, same graph, you will see A, B, C and D, E, F, G, whatever but I'm simply drawing it in a slightly differently. So E is the root of this BFS, let's say. So we start, a, start at a node X, 
perform BFS with a with that node as the root. Fine. Now we need to go to go through this slowly. It's actually a slightly complicated algorithm. So please stop me if you uh, get lost. So these are the levels, obviously. So level zero is the root, level one, level two, and level three. Uh, now observe that level of a node is the length of the shortest path from the root to that node. That means if D and F are in level one, that means I have a length one shortest path from E to here. If this is level two, that means I have a length two shortest path. Also, if G, G is level two, so I have a length two shortest path. There can be multiple shortest paths, but at least there is a, the, the length of a shortest path is uh, two. And similarly, the length of the shortest path to C is three. And we'll call edges between levels as DAG edges. DAG is the usual directed acyclic graph. Uh, so edges between levels, we'll, we'll just call them DAG edges, okay? So each DAG edge is part of at least one shortest path from X. Let's verify that. What does it mean? That if an edge runs between levels, because we did a BFS, if an edge runs between levels, then it will be part of at least one shortest path from X. Obviously, if that is a, an essential edge like this, it will be a shortest part of a shortest path, but it can be an edge like this, which is not an essential, but it's part of at least one shortest path. Now, step two, we'll do some labeling. So we'll do some labeling and we'll mark the label in this way, okay? Each node, the label will be, uh, label to each node will be given by the number of shortest path from the root to that node. So E to E, okay, there is basically the null path. They are only, okay, one shortest path, one shortest path, one shortest path, but here we'll, we'll put a two because there are two shortest paths. Here also we'll put ones, all right? So that's the labeling part. So, so far, all right. Now let's go to the next step. So then uh, just reminding you the label is the number of shortest path to that node from the root. Now credit sharing. So you will actually uh, compute the betweenness now. Betweenness is more like a credit or a load, right? Uh, if you think of how much load is being taken by an age, then you call it a credit and things like that. So each leaf node gets credit one. So we'll give credit to nodes as well as edges. Okay. So we'll get, we'll give credit to nodes as well as edges. So first we'll go bottom up. We will give each leaf node credit one and the credits we will we'll mark in this oval kind of, or not oval maybe, uh, yeah, oval kind of a gray oval. So the leaf nodes get credit one. A, C and G are leaf nodes. They get credit one. What about the non-leaf nodes? As you go up, the non-leaf node should get credit one plus some of the credits of the DAG edges below that level. Now let's go through this very slowly. Now that means, uh, that means we need to first compute the credit of the DAG edges below that level. So what we have done so far is we have only computed or assigned labels, uh, sorry, credits to the leaf nodes, then to compute the credit for this node B, let's say, we need to know the DAG edges credits. Okay, so these are DAG edges. This is not a DAG edge. This AC edge is not important. It will not be part of a shortest path. This is a within level edge, but across level means, yes, you need to, actually uh, give some credit to this node, uh, this edge, and that will be computed by the following. So credit of a DAG edge will be computed in the following way. Let's say Y1 to YK are parents of some node Z, and let's say PI is the label of YI, then the credit of the edge YIZ is credit of Z, times the label divided by all labels of the parents. Okay, now 
let's let's let us uh, you know make this fall into place the formula is abstract let us make this fall into place here we want to compute the credit of this edge ab here b is our only parent of a so we have only y as the parent of z okay so we have to compute credit of let's say b a b a b is the parent a is the child that will be computed by credit of z the leaf or credit of the child that is a that is one here times the label of the parent label of the parent is one right so in this case we have only one pi right only one parent divided by all parents labels here again we have only one parent now why do we have this it will be clear when we have multiple parents in the case of g okay so but right now what happened credit of a times one by one okay so that is simply the credit of the dag edge is just one and the non leaf node b then gets credit one plus some of the credits of the dag edge so this is a dag edge this is also a dag edge and similarly that will also have a credit one then b will have credit one plus one and a plus one that is three is the calculation clear so far the intuition will get better and better as we do another uh, another step but is the calculation clear okay all right so now what happens what happens here is credit of b is 3 you can interpret that as b the node b is responsible for the shortest path from e to three other nodes which are the three other nodes b itself is one node so to come to b you have to come to b to come to a you have to come through b to come to c also you have to come through b so essentially the credit is more like how many shortest paths is this node or this edge responsible for okay that is the intuition so now you see the leaf nodes should have get, should have got credit one because the leaf nodes well you only come to the leaf and you don't go anywhere so that is one shortest path only so this also got one shortest path however these edges are also responsible for one shortest path each so they get credit one but this node is responsible for one plus the, this one is for the node itself plus the sum of the credits below so that's why the credit for this node is 3 all right so let's move on now let's do so obviously this one will again be just a 3 because well it has only one parent and there is only one child and only one dag edge so it's just a 3 this edge is just a 3 okay but d will then be something more to compute and the uh, credit for d we need to also compute the credit for this edge so what is this edge okay this edge will be a 0.5 because now g is my child and d is the parent but g which is z here has two parents right has two parents so two parents are d and f so credit of z or credit of g is 1 times the label 1 by since it has two parents i have to divide by the label of d and label of f p1 plus p2 so that's why it is 1 by 1 plus 1 so that is a 0.5 and here similarly this will also be a 0.5 and hence when we go to the credit of d we will get a 4.5 3.5 plus 1 and similarly this will be a 1.5 1 plus 0.5 and if we keep doing this we will we will get uh, this way here so now the intuition is the following a dag edge gets the share of credit z proportional to the number of shortest paths from x to z going through this or in other words as i told you whether it's an edge or a node how many shortest paths is it responsible for that is the credit and that is your betweenness 
But what have we done? We have computed betweenness of edges only for shortest paths from E. We have taken E as a root, just chosen E as a root, and we have done a BFS. And only we have considered shortest paths from E to every other node. And we have got betweenness scores. But that cannot be our global betweenness score because there are many other ways you can do, right? So, what we need to do? We need to repeat this whole thing for every node as a root. Okay? And then for each edge, we can average them out. So, what we'll do? Sum of credits obtained in all iteration by two, by two, because in case of an undirected graph, if you simply do a betweenness with every node as a root, then you're going to double count everything, right? Okay. Now, by now, I hope you have understood the algorithm, but also you have understood that uh, the daunting complexity of doing this, right? Essentially, for a large graph, you have to, first of all, run a BFS with every node as a root, and then do all of this stuff. So we'll not, let's not uh, you know, spend time to get into the complexity because we'll actually not run uh, this for all nodes. So what we'll do in practice is if there are n nodes and e edges, well, obviously, BFS itself will be order n e time, and that's very huge. But uh, what we'll do is we'll choose a random subset w of the nodes, and we'll run this. So you see that this is becoming a common practice. So I, I mentioned that whether a graph has a locality property, you have to then check locality property starting at every node. Don't do it for every node. Do it for a random subset. You can also do it iteratively. Start with one node first, okay? Then check the property, or let's say compute the betweenness of every edge, okay? Every edge, and then do another node, or maybe start with 500 nodes first or 200 nodes first, okay, 200 random nodes. Do it, okay, like your mini batch or things like that if you have done in neural networks already, right? And then check your betweenness. Do another batch, another random batch of nodes. Then aggregate the betweenness. See if that's changing, right? So as soon as it kind of converges, you know that you have got your reasonable uh, betweenness estimates, right? So then you stop. So that kind of a thing also can be done in this. Obviously, computing betweenness for all nodes as a root, uh, doing BFS with all nodes as a root will be totally infeasible, but you don't have to do it. I mean, there can be a billion nodes, but you just do it for a few thousand. Okay, so that is the essential idea. Okay, got it? All right, so seems fantastic. Now, Let's just see that we have computed betweenness. Now the easy part, okay, which we already know, how do we then use betweenness to find the communities or find the clusters of the network? Well, either we do bottom up or we do top down, right? So the bottom up approach is keep adding edges among the existing ones starting from lowest betweenness, okay? So it's like this, that if you have, if you have these nodes, and there are some edges which are actually between them. I am not drawing, I'm, I have not drawn them. So let's say there are some edges between them. Add the edge which has the lowest betweenness. Lowest betweenness means that they are not like the bridge. They are not across communities. Lowest betweenness means they're actually two closely, closely knit nodes. So we add that edge. Let's say that's an edge. Okay, so we add them into one community and so on and so on and so on and so on and okay. So what happens now? Once we add them, then this actually becomes a single community and this way we expand. So that's the bottom up approach of hierarchical clustering. And the other approach is top down. You start with all existing edges and then if you actually take any real social network, uh, every graph is actually complete, uh, strongly connected. That means uh, social networks are typically strongly connected. I well, forget about fake IDs, uh, which nobody follows and things like that. So if you, if you forget about those kind of spam things, uh, the reasonable part of the social network may be actually one big component. And then uh, 
then what you may have is actually one huge component and then what you do you take the edge which is which has the highest betweenness you remove it but that may not immediately break the whole community into two different communities so just think about kolkata and the howrah right so the ganga river uh, whatever the hubli river is flowing there are three bridges right so if you break one of the bridges they are still connected so you break one one of the bridges okay which has the largest betweenness largest dependency okay then you break and break another bridge which again has the largest dependency so on eventually what will happen is that you are you are break you will break the last bridge between two large communities and then you keep doing this you will actually keep breaking communities into smaller communities okay so this is the top down approach so at some point removing the edge with high, highest betweenness we will split the graph into separate components right okay now which of the two approaches will be better in real case obviously now have you convinced yourself that both approaches will exactly give you the same result if you take the same threshold for betweenness so suppose your 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 instruction is that we have computed betweenness scores done now we will will delete the edges all edges with betweenness above this or keep edges with betweenness below this or we will actually so that's the threshold based approach or we will stop when the number of clusters is so much or or if we keep adding from bottom up we will stop when the number of clusters is so much right so first of all it is deterministic between because betweenness scores are clearly ordered and you are always either deleting from the largest betweenness or you are adding from the lowest betweenness you are actually going to be an well defined um clustering so which one will be better in real case that means in which of the cases you will have to perform less number of operations so let's say consider our desired clustering where we only have edges within cluster and not across cluster that means there are edges within this edges within this but we 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 do not consider the edges across clusters let's say within cluster edges we call them ec and across cluster others we call them eo and then at eb all edges all actual edges that were there then we know that size of basically e uh, is the union of these two things right so size of this is this plus this now our point is is ec more or eo more okay any guy any guess on this ec is more ec should be more right in other words to get to our desired clustering are we likely to add more edges starting from none or delete more edges starting from all that will depend on whether we have more intra cluster edges or more inter cluster edges typically for any useful social network we will have ec will be much more so our top down approach will be more efficient okay all right so i think yeah that's um, yeah so that's pretty much it for today uh in the next few classes we will uh do a few more algorithms on social network uh, gra graph mining and uh, so i repeat uh, yeah so th that's i repeat we'll then this evening at 9 we are going to have the quiz right okay um any any uh, immediate question as of now on this topic this topic will not be part of the quiz link analysis and dimension reduction only uh, sir so here the betweenness is the only a different matrix for uh, uh, for distance uh, actually the algorithm for clustering we are using the same as the, right right yeah. right 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 so the right uh, just a moment let me open that again yes betweenness gives you just a different different metric for uh, distance actually it's not a distance it's more like uh, if your algorithm is hierarchical that you keep deleting bridges then the betweenness gives you uh, um, one approach to um, kind of consider the load of every bridge that's the idea
Okay. Anything else?